welcome to episode 208 of the Cricket Her Weekly and welcome to England where everyone has been obsessed recently with the disappearance of a young woman who hasn't been seen in public for weeks. But enough about Danny Wyatt. We've just been watching the WPL final, Raf. What did you make of it? Do we need to explain what that was an actual reference no. to? Okay, yeah, uh, an amazing WPL final in a number of ways. Um, I guess partly for the fact that Delhi Capitals completely fell apart with the bat, um, but then they actually managed with the ball to take it to the final over. Um, and so we have a new, uh, we have a new WPL champion, um, the Royal Challengers Bangalore, congratulations. Um, and they did win with eight wickets to spare, but with only three balls to spare. And actually, it was quite tense, those last couple of overs, wasn't it? Yeah, I've got, I've got no, no nails left. And I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if quite a lot of the, the fans there didn't either. I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, Elise Perry kind of managed her way through to that. And kind of, you look at that and you go, it feels like Elise Perry had that under control all along. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, if, if, she, if she lost her wicket in those last couple of overs, then it could all have, you know, could all have gone wrong. Um, and but... it's really interesting because actually what we saw in the Eliminator match um, was that Mumbai Indians um, had, a, had a similar issue in that they actually had what should have felt like it should have been a relatively easy uh, target to chase down. I think it was 135. And they left it too late to accelerate. So they actually ended up with too much to do in the last couple of overs. And everyone's talking about the fact that Harmanpreet Kaur got out at the wrong time. And then they had, um, you know, and then RCB were able to really apply the pressure in those last couple of overs. But actually, if they accelerated a little bit more a bit earlier, then it would have been a bit different for them. And RCB were having similar issues today, weren't they? Yeah, that, that was kind of what happened in the in some ways that the, the, there was a sort of calm period in both innings at the, at the end of the power play. Uh, obviously, the, um, the, the, the Delhi Capitals had a very good power play and they put, they put on loads of runs, but then they could just totally lost it and became becalmed. And they also lost those three wickets and that Sophie Molyneux over. Um, but RCB also had a very kind of calm period where they were going at three and over and they didn't seem to be able to get going. But the important thing was that they... What they didn't do was lose, lose all those wickets, and particularly, they, you know, they didn't lose three wickets in an over to, to, to Sophie Molyneux. And, as, you know, that was really the point at which the game turned, wasn't it? Because, you know, we were watching the power play and we were going, this is all over. They're, they're, going, really... to put two, they're going to put 200 on the yeah. board and, you know, and, you know, RCB haven't been hitting a lot of runs in this tournament. You know, they won the Eliminator as a low-scoring match. They won the final as a low-scoring yeah. match. There's, there's no doubt they've done. I think the Philly Capitals have put, you know, even 160 on the board. They would have won that game. Um, but, you know, that over from one you turn around. Um, so we had the first wicket of Shafali. Shafali tried to hit out. In fact, the previous over kind of slightly, you know, turned up the pressure a little bit. Because I mean, three runs of the previous over. Shafali was obviously looking at that going, oh, we need to get going. You know, we need to keep keep the momentum, she hit out, got out. Jamima came in, uh, played defensively the first ball, and then Jamima did get a good ball. Um, you know, that's the second ball that she faced. Um, you know, it, it, you know, she tried to sweep it and it, you know, went through her. And then Alice Capsi, Raph, and you know, <laughs> I yeah. mean, what, what can we say? I mean, well, she's one of our favorite players, but my goodness, Let's sometimes. say that she did um, try desperately to make up uh, with what happened in the first innings with the ball and she did actually send down a few really good overs really tight overs Absolutely. that meant that um, that meant that Delhi Capitals did take it very deep and she's had a good tournament overall but this was really disappointing for her and actually it follows on from what happened almost exactly a year ago in the final where she also got a duck and she got a, a first ball duck today um, and just just really disappointing. Not so much getting the first ball duck because that can happen to anyone, but the way in which she got out. It was a very foolish shot. It was a very unnecessary shot, actually, because as you say, um, RCB don't have great, um, don't have great. Uh, um, they haven't done particularly well with the bat in this tournament, is what I'm trying to say. So actually. Capsi should have been looking to just play sensibly for a couple of overs and she could afford to do that rather than two of my teammates have just got out in quick succession. I know I'll go for a ramp to a ball that clearly isn't suitable to be ramped. And it was as if she would had in her head when she was sitting on the sidelines waiting to come in, looking a bit nervous that she was going to play that shot and she just did it. 
even though it clearly wasn't there to be hit. And that now is a, leaves a little bit of a poor taste in your mouth about her kind of overall development as a player, because we would, would hope that by now, even though in the scheme of things she's still quite young, that she would not be approaching um, an innings in a final like that. Yeah, to go in first ball and do that is just a little bit mad, to be yeah. honest. I mean, it's, you know, it's a glory shot and it's a shot that we all love when it comes off. But at the end of the day, I'm sort of thinking, have coaches not stamped this out? Oh, well, I don't, I don't have figures on this because um, I, I don't have figures for, you know, shots played and things like that. You know, but the teams internally do. And I can't believe that it's a, as a percentage shot that it works out. Yeah, I just... but Sid, I'm um, sorry, you've missed the point of cricket. The point of cricket is to entertain, inspire. <laughs> or, no, no, sorry, to yeah. inspire and entertain. It's one of them. Um, and so actually, you know, it doesn't matter if you get out first ball. Yeah, thanks for that, John Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Anyway, we've really enjoyed the WPL. Um, and actually, it's quite nice to have a, a new name on the trophy and for the eliminator and final to be kind of interesting matches with results that we wouldn't have expected. Well, it shows that, the, you know, the, the, all, the, all the teams were actually reasonably, to be fair, even Gujarat Giants, they were all reasonably matched because they all have some fantastic overseas stars. You know, there's there's a decent strength of player coming through now in India. You know, and we see players like Sriyanka Patel come, has yeah. come through this year. I mean, she was a little bit on the radar last year in terms of, you know, her performance in domestic cricket. Um, but, you know, she's come through, she played in those under-19 games against England and performed really well in the, uh, sorry, not under-19 games, apologies, the A games against England uh, just before Christmas, performed really well, uh, you know, played for India, mm. had a couple of decent performances. She did have that one performance where she got knocked, up, knocked, knocked around in the final over and Harmon <laughs> kind of threw her under the bus. But, you know, massive credit to her that she hasn't let yeah. that incident you know, get to her and she's come back and she ended up with the, the purple cap on her She head. did end up with the purple cap. So, you know... And, um, and of course, Elise Perry ended up with the orange cap, talking of overseas superstars who can come in and, and turn it on. Yeah. So even though RCB, you know, came at mid... They were the mid-table team and they kind of... They almost scraped into that last... Yeah. That last qualification place. They showed that, well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we call it the Women's Premier League, but it's not a league. You know, you don't get the prize for winning the league. You you have to be able to play knockout cricket. And, you know, they did that. They held their nerve. And particularly Elise Perry, you know, kind of that game management at the end was absolutely critical. Good. Right. Shall we talk about Phew. England okay. v New Zealand, Sid? Because that is obviously following Hoth on the heels of the WPL. Um, and actually that in itself is, is a talking point because as we know, the ECB tried to get it moved and they tried to get it pushed back a bit. Um, but the first T20 is happening um, in the in the wee hours of Tuesday morning, UK time. And I, I guess that we're going to be having some not very sleep filled nights. Yeah, we talk about game management. Weeks. We're going to have to game manage our sleep patterns over <laughs> we are. the next couple of weeks. Um, but obviously there's going to be some very critical players missing from both teams in that opening T20. So, of course, Sophie Devine is going to be um, flying from India to New Zealand with a... Um, with a hangover. With, I was going to say with a tournament with a medal round her neck. Thank you, Sid. Um, and she won't be playing a part in that first T20. Neither will, um, neither will Amelia Kerr for New Zealand. Um, of course, England, as we know, have said that the players, um, the England players who opted to remain in India um, for the duration of the tournament won't be playing in any of the first three T20s. So that's obviously Alice Capsey, who we've just been talking about, um, as well as Sophie Eccleston, um, <laughs> Nat Silverbrand, <laughs> Nat Silverbrand and Danny Wyatt, thank you, who we've also just mentioned. Um, so that is quite, those are quite big names for England to be missing the first three matches, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, and you know, you wrote a piece for The Guardian today, Raph, it's, it's gone online today, so you can go and check that out, yeah. um, about, you know, what this kind of done to the England eleven. And I think the, the key winner, as far as, you know, you're, we're concerned, is, is Tammy Beaumont, isn't it? Because yeah. she kind of finally gets her place back in the T20 eleven. She does. And not only that, she's getting her preferred opening spot back. Um, as far as we're aware, we obviously... <laughs> Haven't, haven't had that uh, chat directly with Heather Knight, um, but all of the signs are that Tammy Bowman will be opening because she's, she's been opening well in the, in the, in the warm-up warm -up match. Yeah, exactly. Um, and John Lewis has also said, well, um, we don't see a spot for her in the 11 unless she's opening. So with Danny Wyatt not playing in those um, opening three T20s, it really gives Beaumont the chance to kind of stamp her place um, back and say, I'm going to be opening in the World Cup. 
Of course, in turn, that does put intense pressure on Sophia Dunkley, who's had an extremely poor run of form lately. Um, and um, if Beaumont has a good few matches, Danny Wyatt's not really done anything wrong. So he's going to be probably coming back in, in for games four and five going, hello, I want my spot back. Um, and that puts the pressure back on Dunkley, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, there is potentially a spot down the order for Dunkley, or I suppose arguably a spot down the order for Wyatt as well, although mm -hmm. I think they've definitely concluded that Wyatt's best position is up top. So maybe Dunkley moves back down the order. Um, you know, I mean, it, partly it's going to depend on the fitness of other people and how much seam bowling they think they need. Uh, we think that Danny Gibson will probably play in these, these games in the sort of Nat Siver role. Uh, but, you know, because she offers that seam option, we think that they're likely to prefer her. Um, you know, more more seam, more bat. Danny Gibson's the one that, that they want to take to Sri Lanka for the World Cup. Bangladesh. Sorry, Bangladesh for the World Cup. Apologies. Um, so we think that, you know, Danny Gibson will, will get the nod in these games. Who do we think is going to miss out, Raf? You know, from, from the... Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because they've, of course, called up um, these two players. Um, so... Um, They've called up Lindsay Smith um, and Holly um, Armitage, of course, who's, who's uncapped. Lindsay Smith isn't uncapped, but hasn't played um, since 2019. Um, so it's kind of going into this a little bit cold, but they both have been in New Zealand over the winter. So we'll have some familiarity with the conditions out there. Um, but will either of them be able to kind of claim a place in the 11? Um, obviously, I mean, of the two of them, you'd go, well, maybe there's a spot for Lindsay Smith because we haven't got Eccleston. So um, they need a left arm spinner. That's but... true. But I think that you're definitely going to play Sarah Glenn, um, you know, one of the top T20 performers in, in the world over the past couple of years. And, you know, are you actually are you going to leave out Charlie Dean? I think you're definitely going to play her as well. I mean, I, the, the thinking, presumably, from England is that they're going to go into that World Cup in the subcontinent and play three spinners. So you're probably going to try and give Sarah Glenn and Charlie Dean that game time. Uh, my guess is that that means that it's Lindsay Smith that misses out. Um, but and you know, you've just said that you think that they're more likely to play Danny Gibson as that extra batter yeah, rather so than I think Holly, Holly Armitage. Armitage possibly misses out. The only other thing is, you know, do do England decide to you know give give Holly Armitage a cap as part of this series? Particularly if they win the first two games, I mean. Do, do we expect them to win the first two games? I think we do, don't we? I mean, look, if you look at the performance of New Zealand against England A in their warm-up games, they weren't massively convincing. England were very convincing against New Zealand A. So I'm guessing that these should, these should be easy well, wins for England. Yeah, so maybe. They, they but they are, up, maybe Holly Armitage gets that But they are missing they are missing their four best players and they have had real problems recently when um, Nat Silver Brunt in particular has been absent and they've now got to do without her and their best bowler and their next two best batters. And so I think that it could end up potentially being quite an interesting opening three games. Now, of course, New Zealand cricket have been either kind of more relaxed or less punitive, depending on your perspective. So that means that Sophie Devine and Mealy Kerr are only missing the first T20. They're going to be available for T20s two and three. On paper, that New Zealand team is stronger than that England 11, I think. Well, maybe. I mean, so we'll, I think we'll it could be really see, interesting. I... And I also think that England have got a little bit of a tendency in the last 12 months, unfortunately, to really underestimate opponents that on paper are, are maybe weaker than them. Um, and so and I, I think they need to be really careful with happened. this series, yeah. personally. The other really interesting thing, I think, is how do they look at this series? Because um, we mentioned this very briefly uh, in last week's episode, that actually this is not an ideal series in terms of preparation for that World Cup in the subcontinent, because in New Zealand, you want you want good seam bowlers, and that's how you win the matches. But England need to think about well, what's our balance for the World Cup, and so playing three spinners potentially, and they've got to weigh those two things up of kind of the um, setting up that 11 for the World Cup, who's our best 11, versus we need to do play our best 11 in these New Zealand conditions. Right? Yeah, and you've got to think that Lauren Filer in particular is kind of the, the key question here, yeah. that because you think that she is going to play in New Zealand, but presumably she's not going to play in the subcontinent. Well, She'll be the one to make way for the third spinner. Um, yeah. And, you know, England will just, I mean, Lauren Filer will, will presume, I guess she will go to the World Cup, but I guess that their their plan is that Lauren Bell will yeah. play, the, you know, and if only if Lauren Bell gets injured, would Filer be likely to play? I don't know if it's a sure thing whether she'd even be in that yeah, squad well, for the subcontinent not. because 
I feel like England have actually backed themselves into a corner a little bit over this. They've plucked Lauren Filer out of obscurity and gone, we're going to chuck you into the Ashes test because we think that you've got that point of difference with being a bit quicker. That je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Um, oh, we're also going to play you in the ODIs, but we don't really think you're a T20 player. And we've told you that because she then said that back to the press during mm -hmm. the yeah. Sri Lanka ODIs. Um, and now, oh, but hang on a minute, because we've landed ourselves in hot water because we're now in New Zealand. Um, obviously, Lauren Bell will play as the, the, the premier seamer. We haven't got Nat Sim Runt available. Um, Freya Kemp has got a recurrence of a back injury. Izzy Wong is not even in the squad. Neither is Kate Cross. They're not, they're not considered good enough to play in T20s. Suddenly, we're running out of seamers. The other seamer, okay, who they're really going to miss, I think, is Freya Davies, who, let's not forget, on their last tour of New Zealand two years ago, was the outstanding fast bowler in the group and by far outperformed everyone else. Um, so they've treated her in a way that, um, you know, they've, they've uh, kind of omitted her from the central contracts list. Um, and um, so she's not she's apparently not on their radar now. Um, and I think that they're, they're going to really miss her. And so they've got themselves in a situation where if they want to play another seamer, they've got to play Lauren Filer, despite having said to her, we don't really think you're a T20 player. It's not ideal, is it, Sears? Well, no, I guess not, no. Uh, a quick word about the... The now let's get this right. This is the A team, not the under nineteen team. The A team are yes. also playing. We've had two matches in that A team series already. Yep. The A team series, they're getting through it a little bit quicker. Uh, they'll want to simply want to get them on the on the plane home and avoid their keep their costs down. Well, but um, they are playing. But, they're playing three T twenties yeah, and then they're playing they some are. ODIs afterwards, they aren't are. they? So we've had two T twenties. Yeah. And I think that the best news for England overall was the performance of a certain Grace Scrivens in the second T twenty. Yeah, but she, she she took the game by the scruff of the neck. She scored a half century at well more than a runner ball. Yeah. And that was exactly the kind of performance we want to see from her because we know that there are questions. You know, is has she got it as a T20 player? Um, you know, and we were all looking for that kind of performance and that's the performance that we saw. And, you know, England will be looking at that and going, phew, because that's really what we need from her because the, the only thing that was standing in the way of, you know, her having a long career, mm. a lot of it as England captain, was her T20 performance. What she really needs now is that those that 100 draft for her to get drafted into a team which are actually going to give her a role in the, the, that she can play, um, you know, which she hasn't had for London Spirit over the last couple yeah. of seasons. And, you know, that will hopefully give her the opportunity to flourish and, you know, really put her hand up and say, OK, this is I, I need to be making my England debut over, yeah. the, over the next year. Yeah, well, I read in The Guardian that she's widely touted to make her senior England debut in the next 12 months. Yeah, so. I believe I widely touted her when you were writing <laughs> that <laugh. laughs> Anyway, we're looking forward to some uh, not very sleep-filled nights over the next couple of weeks, um, tuning into England v New Zealand. And finally... Yes, more Project, more Darwin. Project Darwin. Oh, wow. There's it's... no escape from Project Darwin. <laughs> well, it just keeps happening. See, things are happening thick and fast. Beth Barrett Wilder, the ECB, is certainly being kept busy because we have basically had confirmation this week after our attempt to do maths with the bids last week that 16 out of the 18 first-class counties have bid for a team. Brilliant news for the ECB, except now they've got to spend flipping ages <laughs> reading through all the bids ahead of what's going to be um, a, I'm allowed to say this because I came up with the term and wrote it in The Guardian, a Dragon's Den type process whereby all of the bidders will have to go to the ECB offices at Lords, present their bids and then face some questioning. It's going to be quite stringent questioning um, from a panel that's made up of not just internal ECB people, but actually a couple of external heavyweights from the world of women's football, which is very exciting. And who are these heavyweights? Tell us about them, Raf, because people might not be aware, so tell us who they are. Um, they are Kelly Simmons, um, who's the former head of women's football at the ECB. Um, and okay, so she's an administrator. She's someone with, with years of experience in kind of, you know, running a successful sport. And who are, who's the other one? And the other one is Maggie Murphy, um, who's the chief executive of Lewis Football Club, um, who, if anyone isn't aware, are the only football club in the world that I'm aware of to pay their men and their women's teams the same. So okay. they've been a real pioneer in terms of equal pay and kind of equity in women's football. So they're not a top team, are they? But no. they're a team that are, you know, kind of making statements about the way that the game should be run. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I obviously had that exclusive in The Guardian this week talking about 
um, what the content of the bids has been. So um, found out a bit more information about exactly what the counties have been asked to talk about in their bids. Um, and there's been some quite kind of stringent questioning in there, actually, which I think is great. It's absolutely fantastic because um, the thing that's been really concerning me is that counties are going to be able to get away with being a bit half assed about this. And actually, it reads very much to me like these questions, questions are like, you know, it's, it's things like um, how are you going to ensure that from day one, your women's team are going to feel welcome? Um, you know, where does your women's team sit? in the kind of wider club priorities um, and where are your women's team going to train? <laughs> what access are they going to have to top facilities and where are they going to play their home matches? Which yeah, is now a this really is something that got question. people going on social media, yeah. isn't it? Because you, you had lots and lots of quiet tweets on social media and almost all of them were zooming in on the same issue, weren't they? Yeah, which is that actually um, my understanding, having done a little bit of digging for this piece, is that a number of counties in their bids have actually said, well, we can't have the women play at our home, kind of our men's home ground, our first class ground, uh, because it's already at capacity. So we think that the best thing is for the women to play some of their matches at maybe an out ground, a club ground, um, or even an independent school ground. Now, you might go, okay, well, independent school grounds, you know, they're normally very well kept. Some of them are absolutely beautiful, but it's the kind of principle, isn't it? of not saying, OK, well, our main ground are at capacity, so so the men will have to then play some of their games at school grounds and so will the women. It actually feels a little bit more like some of the counties are going, well, sorry, no, we're already full up. Um, the men play here and so the women can just go over there um, and just do their own thing over there. And that's yeah. that's really not the spirit of the whole process. It is disappointing. And I guess the worry is that, you know, in some regions, in regions if every team has said this, and the ECB are going to be a little bit stuck. And I think that, you know, the, the, we're, we're developing this, this kind of hybrid pitch technology, for example, mm. that was used at the Commonwealth Games, um, which does allow you to put a lot more pressure on grounds. And that's the kind, of, the kind of solution that clubs should be exploring to try and ensure they can play repeated mm. games at their grounds. Because, yeah, it does, you know, it is going to put pressure on pitches if you prepare them in the totally traditional way. But, you know, a hybrid pitch can be much more hard wearing. And these kinds of solutions are what we need because, you know, we don't want to be take the game backwards to going back to playing at school grounds and yeah. things which have got no spectator facilities, no media facilities. They've got one toilet that's shared between, you know, I mean, some, somewhere like Mill Hill is, is great, but there's one toilet that's shared between the players and the media and the umpires. Yeah, I mean, and it's in the umpires' yeah. dressing room. <laughs> so this is where kind of back in the day before COVID and before the end of the Women's County Championship, this is where we were rocking up every weekend with our deck chairs um, and we were going to watch county matches, women's county matches, and this is the type of facilities that we were expecting. Now, it was difficult enough in those days when you had maybe 10 or 20 spectators maximum at those games, right? And we were all having to share one toilet. Um, but if there is a genuine opportunity for the women's game to grow commercially, that's just not going to cut it anymore. No, I mean, you're not going to grow commercially if you're playing at school grounds, if you're playing, you know, at places like Mill Hill or Merchant Taylors, or if you're playing at smaller club grounds, which don't have the facilities or which, you know, end up with muddy pitches because the men's yeah. second 11, high poly <laughs> <laughs> So Yeah, so, but what's really interesting, Sid, is that actually um, we've been a bit down on Kent, haven't we? in the last couple of episodes because their approach to this whole process has been quite negative, I must say. But they're now kind of very proudly, apparently, at their recent media day, touting Beckenham as their trump card and going, well, we've got Beckenham and that's a first class facility and that's where the women will play all their games. Which So that's presumably what they've said in their bid. Yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit, it's an interesting trump, trump card though. I, I'm, I'm a little bit sceptical about it in, in the terms of like, Let's just ask, you know, devil's advocate here, because Beckenham is, is a decent ground in many mm -hmm. ways, but actually Beckenham compared to Merchant Taylors, Beckenham spectator facilities, pretty minimal. There is a big stand. There are some not particularly nice toilets underneath that stand. Um, but, you know, there's not much else apart from that. And, you know, and when the Kent men play there, obviously they, you know, they bring in facilities, they bring in yeah. beer tents and they bring in seating and all that kind yeah. of thing. But you know, otherwise you have to sit on the big stand with uncomfortable chairs, which is a long way from the action because of the, you know, the smaller boundaries, because the, the big stand has been put to be well away from the, the men's full boundary for men's first class games. 
Um, you know, there's no media facilities, so the media facilities, you know, are a tent and some 4G Wi-Fi. So, yeah, you know, <sighs> and that's that's been our experience of turning up to women's regional matches there over the last four seasons, right? That yeah, actually, no, that's... it's not been it's not been massively better than some of the um, some of the kind of other facilities. Yeah, and it's not just a personal complaint either, because the other thing that I think is important about Beckenham is you can go, well, Beckenham's great, it is a good facility, it's got, you know, a good gym, and it's got some indoor nets and things, but what it would mean is that that team would be totally separated from the men's team. Mm. The men's team would be at their facility in Canterbury and everything the men do would be in Canterbury and the women would be at Beckenham and they'd be utterly separate. So the whole goal that Beth Barrett World has talked about of having, you know, both teams Teams come together and be as one you know like the fact you know we're looking at the yeah. fact that like, like Arsenal Football Club where the men and the women both train at the same facility or, like in, or like in the hundred yeah. a cricket example so you know whereas the Beckenham kind of totally segregates yeah. them and leaves them you know 60 miles from each other and that's not really what we want to see either ideally so it's, it's difficult yeah whereas our understanding is that for example Lancashire who were talking about building another facility at Preston um, are actually going to have the women and the men playing both at Emirates Old Trafford and playing at the facility at Preston. So there will be a greater degree of unity and there will be a greater degree of parity as well, because I think that's the important thing. It's about parity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we will see how the, the Project Darwin process unfolds um, because the interviews are taking place at Lords later this week and next week. Um, so, you know, any, any other information anyone has that they would like to share, um, I can promise you that sources are kept confidential and we're very interested to hear more about how this process unfolds. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, for thanks, in. thanks for watching this week. We, we did have a couple of questions this week about the WPL and things. We're going to take them into next week. So if you've got any other questions, contact us on social media, yeah. contact us below the line on YouTube, and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible next week. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Bye.